Okay, so today we're talking about marketing. Everyone's favorite topic. Um, and we'll start with the like the basics of like how I've gone about recruiting the orchestra for TFO. So recruiting or marketing to musicians as TFO is an opportunity for them, and then also community engagement. So getting all of our people involved in Branson and then ultimately marketing because to me there's all kind of one cohesive unit. Um, so many of them, so many things I do for one bleed into the other. So I will share my screen and we can keep going on this presentation. So just a few things about orchestra recruiting. Um, the goal ultimately is to have a full orchestra assembled by May 1st each year, mostly because that's that gives us like just barely enough buffer time to fill in any uh, potential openings that happen or any issues that occur. Because um, inevitably at least one person will call and have like a family emergency or or fall ill or just fall off the face of the planet. Um, it has always been strange to me like how how often musicians will just like disappear. Mm. It's like it, it blows my mind because I go into this thinking they want careers and I want to help them build their careers and then all of a sudden like they they can't bother to write me an email and tell me that something came up and they can't do it anymore and so I'm left to guess figure it out for myself, which I hate. So there's nothing else to consider if you're a musician being contracted by things like this, be reliable. Um, I think it's an important lesson on both ends. Um, we do have about 80 positions to fill, so it is a little bit of a hefty task. Um, this year we just started doing an audition tour, which really helped uh, with filling all of these positions. Um, we had more auditions this year than we have ever had in the history of TFO. Like if you combine all the auditions from previous years of TFO, it would not equal the amount of auditions we have this year due to the live audition tour. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, and I, and I get it. I was the same way in school. I would have absolutely preferred to play in person with people or to show up and do an in-person audition. Um, and we recruit musicians through a lot of different ways. We speak directly with them. We do a little bit of online advertising. And by online advertising, I mean we'll do some like Facebook and Instagram ads. We don't really buy Google ads for TFO or we haven't yet. Um, and I'll come back around to that because I have also recently started a for-profit business and have learned a tremendous amount about online advertising in the last couple of years getting ready for that um and we do write a lot of personal emails I think the first year most of the orchestra members we got for TFO came because of a personal email that I wrote to every single one of them and it did have a little bit of a template but I was able to like put their name in like dear Kelly I have a violin position for you and like identify what instrument they're playing specifically I think that was a real, I think Kelly, a violinist, was a real person I did write to the first year. Fine. Keep at me. Um, so one of the, probably the biggest factor in getting musicians to come to TFO is the programming. Um, because so many of our musicians are students or people who are just getting started in their careers. Um, they are looking for opportunities to play pieces that are on their bucket list or are excerpt worthy or something of that nature. Um, and now we also have this professional development programming and that really helps too. That helped a lot this year. Um, so programming for TFO is a really delicate balance uh, between community enjoyment and musical satisfaction because something that uh, Joe and I do all the orchestral programming together is a 100% collaborative um, and we're always kind of towing that line between music that's going to be fun for the orchestra to play and music that's going to be great for the audience to hear. So of course, like, and this is the thing about audiences, audiences always think they want to hear Star Wars and they want to hear movie music and they want to hear Beethoven's at night. 
um, this is where we can step in with our artistic ideas and recognize that I understand what they want it like they want to hear like something really exciting and romantic if they want to hear John Williams right so maybe I'll program Dvorak instead right you kind of have to focus in on not not the specific thing they're asking for but what do they want to hear like what excites them about classical music what kind of classical music will get their get them going um and we do collaborate a little bit with local musicians and ensembles to get them involved because Branson is a very uh, music centric community, but most of the musicians in town are country musicians. We have, we honestly don't have a ton anymore that are playing with us because they're a little bit overwhelmed. Um, there are like a handful of people who play in show in the country shows that have classical backgrounds that will join us, especially because we have orchestra rehearsals in the morning and they're not their call times aren't until the afternoon for shows in town, so they can participate. Um, and at least because, because we don't charge admission to TFO, we are legally allowed to use our MSLP as our library. We don't have to pay for, we don't have to pay publishers or for the rights of anything in the public domain. If we were charging admission to the concerts, that would be different. Then we would definitely have to buy sheet music from the composers or pay some kind of royalty to, or sorry, the composers, the publishers. We would have to pay some kind of royalty to the publishers if we were charging admission to the concert. Um, and essentially the programming options in the public domain are limitless. And we try to balance that out with like maybe one or two pieces that are not in the public domain that are, that were composed by people who are also dead, um, like Copeland. Copeland's a good example of a composer whose music is not in the public domain, um, but he is dead. Um, and we obviously play a lot of music by living composers, um, and we do our best. It's it's really it really comes down to the cost. Um, it's not that we don't like the idea of playing music as a, as a composer. I resent that idea. Um, it's just really expensive, even. The way we're structured, which is that we don't charge, the fact that we don't charge admission to our concerts gives us a lot of breaks. And one of those breaks is with our rental fees and our licensing. So for our BMI and ASCAP licenses, so um, those are just the acronyms for the two organizations that you need to subscribe to in order, like basically, to not get in trouble with living composers. Um, they basically are have these assembled teams of lawyers that like keep track of what's going on in the world and, and the internet to make sure that composers are getting the royalties that they deserve for their work. Um, so every year we have to submit our program book to ASCAP and BMI and then they charge us whatever we're uh, whatever we owe the composers. So it's just they're the middleman between us and the composers. And it really does make our life a little bit easier. Um, and then we have like a yearly fee to be a member and I think it's like $400, which is the lowest it can possibly be because we don't charge admission to concerts. Um, but even like to play, to play Appalachian Spring, which we did in the third season was like $800. And again, that's adjusted for the fact that we don't charge admission to concerts. That's just like the lowest rate that they'll charge you to rent these crusty old falling apart parts or an orchestra. Um, and we make scans of everything so that we don't end up losing parts or anything and so that they don't get destroyed in the process because some of them really are like fragile and crumbly and gross. Um, what else? Yeah, so we can program anything from the public domain and that's great. Um, and then we have a special donor who will provide, who will reimburse us for whatever non um, public domain pieces we program, which is nice. Um, yeah, and then rental music is complicated. Um, I do, I think that playing at Pops concerts in Branson would potentially be a slippery slope. A lot of people ask me why don't we do Pops concerts in Branson, because Branson is one giant Pops concert. Like, what is what would be the point? Like, then all of a sudden we become a Branson show. Um, 
and I, I just don't like them. Like as a musician, I find them unfulfilling. Um, so I, and I know that my opinion isn't universal. I know that not everyone feels that way. Um, I know a lot of people do. And I know that the one time I got close to doing an actual pops concert, it was really a miserable experience for everyone involved. So I try to steer clear of those and substitute in the jazz. Um, there was a time when we did have a big band at TFO and big band, so like a 16 piece uh, horn section and rhythm section. And they would play on the landing in Branson, which is a big shopping center with like fire and fountains and on white candy combo and stuff. Um, because we had a sponsor there who would pay all of our sound expenses and pay for the venue costs and stuff. Um, and we stopped doing those concerts because the sponsor backed out. The sponsor was Parks, Branson Parks and Rec. Um, and it was a really nice partnership until a lot of their funding was cut and they weren't, and consequently so was our programming on the landing. So now our jazz program has been kind of reduced to um, these combos that will feature after a big concert. Um, so after a big concert, big orchestra concerts, we move the party to like a local bar or cafe where we'll have a jazz combo playing and musicians and audience members can socialize together and have a good time. Um, so I think that's really important too, to build those relationships between community and orchestra. Um, children's programming is extremely important. Um, it's not really a recruiting tool that we use to get musicians in the door, although it has been for some people. Some people are like really into the idea of the fact that we do some kind of children's programming. And what my favorite commission that TFO has ever done with a living composer was for a children's concert. We commissioned a guy to write a piece of music um, for orchestra and narrator called Aliens. And we performed it like three times. It was really fun. Um, and even like the group of little kids that we worked with prior to TFO got to contribute some musical content to the composition. Um, the woman who did the narration was really gifted and it was just a really fun experience. And out of it came some brand new music, which was really cool. Um, and at the end of the day, children are the future. I know that sounds so cheesy, but um, programming for kids is so important to any organization uh, like future. If you want sustainability, you have to do children's programming because that's how you build classical music fans. Like <laughs> basically building your audience base from the time they're small children. Teaching them to love classical music at an early age is really important. And of course, I believe music festivals should be champions of new music and that's why we do so much music by living composers and why we're always um, working with composers to create a new experience for TFO and new music. Um, so a little bit about our musician impact. Um, we have had summers where over 100 musicians came to TFO. Um, and that was insane. I've never had such a hard time with housing. <laughs> so there's like two summers where over 100 musicians came to TFO. And they're coming from everywhere. Um, of course, like the big hubs for TFO are places where I went to school. A lot of people that play in TFO were classmates of mine. Um, from my three institutions, which were the University of Kansas, Michigan State University, and Florida State University. Um, but we also have little hubs like in New York, and Chicago, and LA, and Texas. Um, places where I never really lived, but um, people have either moved there or the reach has just grown. Um, Everyone in the orchestra is uh, either a music major at a university or a young professional. Um, a lot of, like all of the people who started coming to TFO nine years ago are, I think they're all graduated, at least with their master's degree, if not with their doctorate. I think there are 12 nine year members of TFO, which is saying a lot considering that the first year the orchestra was only 35 people. And now it's about, 80 each year. Um, like Chelsea Kosiatic is a nine year member. She plays the flute, Dr. Chelsea, and Dr. Steve, the trumpet player, a bunch of them. Nate, the recording engineer, is a nine year member of TFO. Yeah. Um, 
something I really like about TFO is that musicians build uh, lasting friendships with their host families in the community. Um, and we'll talk about the community engagement strategies of TFO in a little bit, but part of the deal is that we put all of the musicians up with host families so that they're, um, they have a comfortable place to stay while they're in Branson and it cuts way down on our costs as an organization. We'll talk about the fundraising values of in-kind really, in kind donations and especially this like host family situation as a fundraising talk on Thursday. Um, and ultimately, I think TFO provides musicians an opportunity to like not just broaden their horizons and expand their networks, learn new repertoire and stuff, but just to have fun playing music and in a way that allows them to find their own voices. Um, the reason I wanted to start TFO, like for me, like selfishly, was because I went to a music festival that was very similar to TFO. And that's where I felt like I finally found my own voice as a musician because I wasn't making, I wasn't just learning music to play for my lessons or to play at school. I had to do it by myself and I was responsible for all of the artistic decisions. No one was gonna approve or disapprove of them except for me and whoever I was playing chamber music with, um, which was huge. Like I think I always knew I wanted to be a musician but that really solidified that I was going down the right path, that I was comfortable there and happy with in that kind of environment. So here's some photographs of like some of my favorite moments in TFO community engagement history. So this was a performance of Bolero by Ravel. Um, you can see the string players are sitting up in the altar of this church, but there are some flute players in the aisle and then the bass clarinetist back here and there's Steven and Chelsea. Um, and this was probably an oboe spot. Oh yeah, there's Rachel Masco, the oboist. Um, and you can see it's, it's like a little packed house in there. Um, it was hot and all get out, but um, that ended up being like probably one of our favorite moments of TFO. It was, this was the first piece and we did it as a flash mob basically. So there's no one on stage and it started with a flute, starts with a flute solo and percussion or snare drum, right? And so that's all that was on stage. At first was the flute player was standing on the podium and the snare drum player was doing this thing right there. Um, and then slowly we started adding people. I think I was playing the B flat clarinet solo. So I was like standing or sitting in the audience. And I had to like stand up <laughs> from being like in the middle of the pew, like over here, I think, uh, and play and then move myself back and around to my, this is me over here. You can't see me, but I moved it right here. Um, and it resulted in a standing ovation immediately and people still talk about this concert. This was the fifth season of TFO, I believe. And it's still one of our favorite moments. Oh, here we go. Yeah, you can see the, these are string players over here moving their way to the back or moving their way to the, the altar to find their position. And it looks like Rachel's playing her English horn solo or Obo de Mori solo probably because it's Bolero. Um, and this was back in the day when we had um, saxophones. We used to have this like big saxophone program. We had a saxophone quartet that would attend every year. And this was our very first fundraiser ever. Um, and we'll talk about fundraising in the idea of community engagement again on um, Thursday when we really dig into fundraising. But um, fundraising should be seen as an opportunity not just to raise money, but also to develop your community as a whole. Um, within the, what is it, the orchestra or your musical organization and your community and audience. And you can see there, these guys are playing on someone's terrace on the landing, this foggy Lake Tini Como behind them. And that was maybe the hottest thing we've ever had to play at outside. But it was really successful. Um, I think we made money off of that fundraiser, which is unique to fundraisers. Usually big fundraising events come out even. Again, we'll get back to that later. And this is another form of community engagement. So something I forgot to mention when I talked about how we collaborate with local ensembles is that we collaborate pretty heavily with the local choir. Um, so there are choirs in almost every church in town, but there is an official organization called the Branson Chorale, which Kyle Denton is the head of in Branson. He's playing percussion in TFO right now. Um, 
So this is one of our concert, one of our chamber concerts at First Presbyterian Church, in which the we had a resident woodwind quintet at the time, and where the woodwind quintet is accompanying the choir on some Dixieland tune, some like very traditional American tune. So this is the perfect segue into community engagement as a whole. Not only talk about how we bring in the musicians and how they start to engage with members of the community and kind of bring it full circle now. Um, community engagement is all about building relationships between your organization and all of your communities, be it musical or local, your audience members or your orchestra members. Um, there's a, a great book on community engagement that I love by Doug Borwell called Building Communities, Not Audiences. And it's a really inspiring book to read. It's pretty philosophical about the idea of the state of classical music in America and going to classical music concerts. Um, if you're interested in community engagement at all and the, the impact that we have on each other as like arts organization and audience, I really recommend reading Doug Borwell's Building Communities, Not Audiences. It's a fun read. It's a pretty quick read, all things considered. Um, and it's very inspiring. Um, so ways we try to tie our organization directly into the community is, again, in fundraising um, through our host families and nightly dinner parties. So this is a way that you can tie in all aspects of what makes arts organizations difficult to do um, into one cohesive unit. So to save money on costs like so we don't have to rent hotel rooms for everyone we put everyone up in ho with host families local community members that kind of adopt the musicians as like new family members um i know i have talked to like this family the mcqueens who always host steve and dan and they come to every concert that dan and steve are playing in and when i i i didn't there was a concert i didn't realize that dan and steve were playing in i was like oh where are you how are you guys doing? What are you doing here? And they're like, we have to come hear our kids play. And they, they know they're not children, but they, you know, they accept and incorporate the orchestra members as part of their household during the festival. Um, and through the nightly dinner parties, which if you haven't been to TFO before, um, we do group dinners almost every night in someone's house in Branson. So the whole 80 member orchestra will just pile into these people's like single family homes and eat dinner. And it's great. Some of the homes are really beautiful. Um, when Vicki and I were just talking about the Justice's home earlier today, Jim and Jennifer are Justice. And yes, Jim was a judge. It's real. You can't make this stuff up. Judge Jim Justice and his wife Jennifer, the librarian. Large, but it's true. Um, had this great house that overlooks a cliffside over Lake Chain Como, and it's one of our favorite places to eat dinner. Um, so in in those two things alone, we've saved I don't know two hundred fifty thousand dollars every year because we're getting these meals donated and we're getting these ho this housing donated. Um, yeah. Oh, and the venues. We don't pay for venues at all at TFO. Um, but this concept of non-traditional venues is a great way of community building. And I guess now they're becoming more traditional. Maybe I need to reconsider my verbiage. Um, so we don't play in like a formal concert hall at TFO in Branson. Probably the closest we get is putting the orchestra in a high school auditorium. For a community with dozens and dozens of theaters designed for music, um, there isn't an actual professional hall there that's appropriate for an acoustic orchestra. The high school auditorium is probably the best space we have. Um, and even for like the size and number of churches that are in town, very few of them have an altar space large enough to hold an orchestra. And the one that actually does won't let us play in there unless we're an entirely Catholic orchestra because it's a Catholic church. Bummer. I can't force Catholicism on everybody, including myself. So anyway, 
getting into these non-traditional venues is a nice way of building relationships with uh, businesses in town. Um, so our first concert ever at TFO was at um, a coffee shop called Vintage Paris Cafe, and it was just a small chamber music concert. It was a funny assortment of like string quartets and wind quintet and solos and trios and things. Um, but they've been huge supporters of TFO ever since. It, they, you know, they were one of few places that actually didn't like seem kind of insane when I walked into their place and was like, "Can I do a classical music concert here with my friends?" Um, so, yeah. It's a great way to like support local businesses because it brings people to their establishment. Um, and I know that's I, something that probably Vintage Paris is both grateful and sorry for in regards to TFO because we have a, a capability of totally swamping them with hundreds of people and it's a small space. Um, but at the same time, we're bringing all these people to the Vintage Paris that might not have otherwise gotten to go or thought of going. Um, and that's often how, if I, if I'm trying to work with a new venue space that's interested in hosting TFO, but they're not convinced, that's always the selling point is that we're going to bring a lot of people into your establishment that might not have come before, which is the truth. We're doing them a favor as much as they're doing us a favor. Um, and this concept of abolishing concert etiquette, I don't really encourage people to like get up and hoop and holler, but we're also not judgmental if people clap between music. If they did get up and hoop and holler, we wouldn't judge them for it either. That would be interesting. But it's funny how, like, this community that I thought would not like an orchestra because of the traditional etiquette and all, um, have not only come to love the orchestra, but have learned the rules. It's very strange to me. Like, there is no clapping between movements anymore. But they're not that big of a deal to me. My dad always argues that, like, with methods, with the tonality of the music. <laughs> mm, I guess. I can still tell that we went from major to major. Does it really matter if we went from B major to F major? No, just me. Um, it's not going to, clapping in the middle is not going to affect that. Um, and of course, we're always creating new traditions um, and engaging extra musical artists. And by extra musical artists, I mean people who are like painters or like visual artists or dancers or something. It's been a long time since we had dancers, but I think we had dancers in like the second or third season of TFO. And that was really fun. It was like a children's dance ensemble led by one of our board members. Um, it was a new piece of music and it was a good time. Um, if we had a large enough space, I'm sure one day to do a ballet would be super cool, but I don't know that we'll ever have that kind of space in Branson to do any kind of theatrical production. Um, and feedback. We also engage our community by asking for feedback. If they like or dislike something, positive or negative feedback is really important. And this is the thing about feedback. Um, you have to be open to it. Um, I don't know if any of you guys are Parks and Rec fans, but there's this moment, like in the very first episode ever, where Leslie Nope, who is the main character, says, when people are yelling at me, I just hear them caring loudly at me. Um, and it becomes, that idea becomes more and more true every year. It's like this year I received like, more like overtly like aggressive and angry messages on behalf of TFO than I ever had before. Um, but at the end of the day, it's because like people care <laughs> so much about TFO and they just want their voices to be heard about this organization that they care so much about. Um, but you also have to be open to the fact that maybe some of their ideas are good. Like you need to hear them and you need to allow them to voice their opinions in some capacity. Um, but you have to be open to it at the same time. So here's some of my, my some more favorite community engagement moments at TFO. So this is a, a children's concert. This is years ago. Um, this is Nick Chula playing trumpet. Um, and you can see he's in the library, a children's library in Branson. And this little girl's like 
covering her ears. She's into it. Like, I remember being at this concert and this little girl crawling up from about here when he started playing. It was like, she wanted to be up there, but was not asking for it to be that loud. Not quite that loud. But you can even see that, like, this room full of children is like, they are watching him. They are in it for the long haul of like a half hour or whatever that we're gonna be there playing for them. And this is something we do every year. This is our main source of children's programming is giving a little like meet the instrument session at the local library. Shut up, you. Um, and another thing we do for patrons um, of a certain donation level, we invite them to a special open rehearsal. We try to do that every year. Um, I think this was during the first year we, we did it and we invited, you know, you can see a handful of heads out in the crowd. They're just listening to us have our rehearsal. Our rehearsals are always technically open, um, but giving people a special invitation will encourage them to take advantage of things more than just like saying this is open and free for everybody. That is an argument for charging ticket admission, actually, is that sometimes the exclusivity of buying a ticket makes it more appealing to some people. But I think in our community, um, it's more important to them that they're not um, putting money into something that they're unsure about. There, that little argument goes both ways. Um, and here is an image from that same season of an orchestra concert. This is uh, one of our best attended concerts. I don't remember what we were playing on this night, but usually this hall seats 750 people. This is our hall in Branson High. Seats 750 people, and I think our highest capacity we've had in Branson High is a little over 500 people. It might have been this concert, but I'm pretty sure last season we also saw a concert with at least 500 attendees. Um, something else that we do is that we try to deliver program notes from the stage. Um, if you'll notice in your, even in the digital program book this year, there are no specific program notes, nothing about like the history behind the music or the context of the music. Instead, we try to get orchestra members, at least, in, and musicians in general to talk about pieces as they perceive them. I really like this picture because this guy is, this is JR and he lives in Branson and he's a cellist. Um, and he was one of those folks that uh, played in country music shows forever um, and joined our group because it was a fun way to play classical music during the year. And he's talking about Appalachian Spring in this piece, or in this picture, and just telling people to like sit back and enjoy and just let the music wash over you. And it's really a simple sentiment, um, but we've just found that people in our audience respond more from these personal deliveries of program notes than they would from having to read something. And they're more interested in the people, they're more interested in our musicians and each individual person than they are in the like historical content or the academic side of music, which is important to remember if you have a community, if you're working with a community that um, doesn't isn't like in a college town or there's not like some major educational institution within it. Um, they won't have the same academic expectations for concerts that we might have as professional musicians. Oh yes, and this is back in the days when we had a saxophone orchestra. For better or worse, there was a year when we had 12 or 13 saxophone players playing in TFO. Um, but I really love the setting of their concert. This, they, their host family that year was a, a motel, like out on the ridge, like overlooking Table Rock Lake and it had a gorgeous view. Um, and it was like this couple was trying to fix up this motel. And in the meantime, they let like the entire saxophone gang stay there. Um, so we thought we should just give their concert <laughs> there. Why not? Um, and that was fun. I think we had like ice cream and like family friendly concessions at this event um, and the scenery was beautiful and the music was really fun and it worked well for the saxophones because saxophones are loud we all know it um, so they're the group that was going to fare best in this kind of environment we aren't doing as many outdoor concerts as we used to because we are just hot and fired 
and over it. And this is what one of the big band concerts would have looked like back in the day. So you can see there's a big band placed on the landing and a really good crowd. Um, one of the advantages to this concert initially was supposed to be that um, it would be good marketing to try and get people to come to some of our orchestra concerts um, because we would count somewhere around like 2,000 people coming in and out of this concert in the audience, which of course is the largest audience we would see all season. Um, but we weren't seeing a ton of audience growth after those concerts. So that was another, we weren't willing to invest in the venue when the, our sponsor backed out because we didn't, we didn't really see a direct connection between audience attendance and to the orchestra concerts and the these big band concerts. It was fun though, while it lasted. I did a lot of dancing with little children. Good times. Oh. I don't like this picture. I don't, I thought I deleted it from this, but I guess I didn't. And you can see this is another member of our community choir engaged with our organization. I believe this is when we did um, Vivaldi's Gloria. We've done some like pretty major works with the local choir for better or worse. I think the first one we did was Foray's Requiem, which was maybe a little bit too challenging for everybody, uh, both choir and orchestra. And that was a moment where we chose that piece, I think because we were listening <laughs> maybe a little too well to the community. And that's looking back is probably a time where we should have thought, well, what do they actually want to hear? What is the goal of requesting Foray's Requiem? Is it to hear their foray or do they want to hear like some sweet romantic with the choir. It's fine. Live and learn. It's like, as I was telling Nate a few days ago, you don't, you can't learn without giving it a shot, right? Like, I can't learn what kind of programming is going to work best for TFO without giving it a shot with my community. Oh, and I love this image because these are cards that were drawn by an orchestra member, one of our violists. Um, drew these cards for his host family to say thank you for hosting him. Um, and his host, Greg, is a um, radio DJ. And Meg, um, I think she was the receptionist at the church where we did a lot of our concerts and things. But I just thought this was a really thoughtful expression of his thanks to his host family and shows how well those relationships are built even just after a couple of weeks. And here's a little piece of feedback. We do hand out surveys and not everyone, of course, not everyone fills around and hands them back in. Maybe like, I don't know, 10%. Like the, we need to get more surveys back. We should have a better track record than we do. Um, but this is an example of positive feedback. This person just loves the whole concept. Um, but my favorite part is the, <laughs> should the guy standing up to play the double bass was just wonderful. She's talking about a specific person that caught her eye during the festival, which I think is really sweet. And this is at the end of a concert. I think this is the end of every concert at TFO, luckily. So you can see that the hall isn't full. Like, we still have a ways to go. We're still building our audience. Um, but it's a really happy audience. It's a really happy community. And we are doing our best to make everyone happy, both the orchestra members and the audience members. I think we do a pretty good job, but of course, we always have stuff to learn. There's always something to experiment with, and there's always something new to try. So digging into marketing and specific things. Um, oh, man. Um, I had a marketing-specific job for almost two years where I did marketing for um, an arts organization here in Kansas City called the Friends of Chamber Music, and it was awful. Mostly because of the boss, but also because marketing is just, it's, I think marketing is hard because things are always changing. There isn't like a set of marketing rules that you learn in school and that's it, you're like ready to go. Um, especially when it comes to things like social media, social media algorithms are constantly changing. 
like week to week. It can, like what might have appealed to people and reach people one week is going to be totally different the next, potentially. Maybe not. Maybe it does stay the same, but maybe it changes. Uh, it's enough to make one like totally freak out. Um, so let's talk about how to like get into your uh, visual representation or your visual identity. Um, I know for TFO, like I don't, I consider myself like a visually disinclined person, which is not true. It's just how I feel. I feel insecure when thinking about things that are visually appealing. Um, especially when it comes to like logos and designs. Um, it's getting better the more I play around and experiment with things. But um, our marketing stuff is all design. We have a marketing director and then we have a graphic designer. And our graphic designer is Steven Smith with Blue Player. Um, he is a professional graphic designer. And for his, um, basically for his degree program, so to get his whatever, Bachelor of Fine Arts in Graphic Design or whatever degree he got, um, instead of writing a thesis or doing a senior recital or something, he had to do a complete rebranding for an organization. And he got to pick it, so he picked TFO. So it, it wasn't a rebranding, it was just a branding because he did not have a brand at the time. And so all of these like concepts of paint splatters, paint splatters and drawings are all of his original ideas. Um, so we wanted to create a logo that would match or complement our mission statement. And the things about our logo that do that are the fish and the violin specifically. So that fish is a trout and in Lake Tammy Tomo in Brainston, it is so cold, it's like 60 degrees year round and can only really support trout. Um, it's mostly rainbow trout, but there are some brown trout in the river or the lake. Sorry. Um, and other lakes in Branson are warm enough to support things like bass and sunfish and perch and catfish and all that stuff, but Lake Tanikamo is not. So I wanted it to be a trout as like representation of the lake in which we, after which we're named. Um, and I wanted there to be an instrument that was very classical. Um, I was actually a little bit torn about the idea of using a violin because um, the fiddle is the state instrument of Missouri, not the violin, the fiddle. Um, and we often associate the violin with country music and I didn't want to fall into that like Branson mentality necessarily. Um, so we kind of compromised with this rather ambiguous looking string instrument. A lot of people ask me why I have a tattoo of a fish and a cello on my back. They're like, is it out of tune? Uh, oh, it's so bad. Such bad jokes, um, but it's kind of an ambiguous string instrument. I still call it the fish and the fiddle for the sake of alliteration. Um, and the paint flyers actually came from um, the tattoo that I do have on my back. I took the, the logo of just the black outlines to this watercolor tattoo artist and said, make this. And she did, and it, the result was a lot like what you see, um, which is Steven's digital uh, representation of her painting. Um, and you can see this is like our primary logo now, and this is kind of a secondary version of it. And you can see the different instruments kind of peeping out from the paint splatters. This one's my favorite. It's, it's, you know, it's really busy and it's way too involved to use like on a letterhead or anything um, because it is so exciting, but I really love it. Um, and this down here is our letterhead. We really only use this logo for um, like grant applications or letters or any like official documentation that are like our first TFO t-shirt ever had that logo on it. The most vintage TFO t-shirt has that logo, but again, primarily used as a letterhead. Um, I really like this logo because it looks like Branson to me. Um, as you can see, winding Lake Tanikomo, which is rather river-like, and then this curve of this violin kind of reminds me of the mountainside, and of course we have this fish, the trout coming in around the side. Um, so that's how we try to complement our mission statement, was really reflecting the community and the musical content of Tanikomo Festival Orchestra. Um, so once you have like a brand or at least the concept of a brand, then you can start making your presence known. Um, a strong internet presence today is imperative. It's where you 
to start. I think it doesn't matter if you are like a person that's just trying to build a more stable entrepreneurial career, or if you're trying to build an ensemble, if you want to start a festival like this one, um, you need a website. Um, I would start with a website and then move from there. If you feel like exploring, I'm the manager of three different websites. Uh, TeenyComoFestivalOrchestra.org. You can do a little auditing on that website, which we talked about in the last couple of lessons about auditing. Um, LarkinEsanders.com and CleverClarinetist.com. Um, so I always say start with your start with your brand and then move on to your website. Um, then you can work on things like social media, which is the remaining which are the remaining aspects of your web presence. Um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, I think, are the most important platforms of social media for, um, for musical arts organizations. Because um, YouTube, you can put up all of your performances or any, like, informative things you want to share with people that you think writing is going to come and reading is going to be so much work. Um, Facebook, it's, like, primarily going to, it's pretty universal, but I think it's more, more for, like, millennials and older generations of course like gen z's and all the younger people are going to be on instagram and then twitter is just i don't get twitter i have twitter set up on everything so that it's like auto posted to it's it's not something i have like spent any time on or really understand if you want to know more about like twitter algorithms and how to be effective on twitter i encourage you to do research elsewhere um Something I have learned about social media in starting my for-profit business is that um, it's really worthwhile if you want to build a social media presence without spending all of your time on social media to use a third-party platform to do all the posting for you. I use this website called Planoli, and basically it starts from Instagram and publishes all of your posts to Facebook and Twitter, additionally, and Pinterest if you want to do Pinterest. I probably should do Pinterest. I just, it's another thing that I don't get. I don't get Twitter, I don't get Pinterest. Um, except when it comes to looking at pictures of weird stuff, I guess. Um, but I can, you know what, I'll take you on a little tour of Planelli so you can see what I'm talking about. Do, 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 do. I think I spend $8 on Planelli every month. It's kind of like a Netflix subscription. Um, but it's invaluable to me when I can just sit down on Monday for like two hours and do all of my social media posting for my businesses at once. And they're like all spaced out and it'll help me choose the timing too because it is keeping track of all the algorithms. Oh, rude. Okay, good. I was going to say, I was just on this yesterday. I shouldn't be totally logged out. Um, so this is for the clever clarinetists. This is a TFO's Planoli. Um, but you can see it's keeping track of all of my posts. And these are all scheduled. So I have this line of uh, dorky zodiac designs for the clever clarinetists. And obviously, Cancer is coming up next. And it is planned. Um, so you can go in and upload pictures and write your little post. And it'll give you the op like, it'll help you pick a schedule. I use this grid quick schedule and it shows you the best times of each day to post on social media. Again, it's based on Instagram. And if you want to get really specific about timing, I encourage you to do a little bit of research into that because Facebook timing and Instagram timing are unfortunately different. Generally, scheduling on Facebook is more effective if it's done in the morning. And Instagram is more effective if it's done in the afternoon. Or at least right now, that's what it is. Um, so if I want, if I have a post that I really want to be like effective and to reach as many people as possible, I will do a separate thing. Like I'll put it in Planoli for Instagram and then I'll go into Facebook and plan ahead that way. <coughs> I also don't believe that Instagram allows for planned posts unless you're paying extra for it anyway. So if you're interested in planned Instagram posts, um, I think this is the best way to go. Um, so this is the grid. Yeah, it just makes it easier to get like zoom through this stuff. And you can see I picked automatically post to ah post to Twitter too. Goodness, posting to all the things automatically, and it saves 
your hashtags for you so you don't have to type those out every time. I have like different topics that I like to use post on different things, even like my pets. Sometimes there's a cute picture of Miko and Miles that have to go on the Clever Clarinet's Instagram or whatever. Um, yeah, like even like if I'm posting about a piece of sheet music, then I have like a whole list of things pertaining to sheet music um, or swag. So they'll let you put up to 20 or yeah, 30, I think, hashtags and 20 tags. Um, so you can see I just thought of like anything, anything that could be potentially pertinent to like swag for my business and add it in there so I don't have to type it in or think about it every time. It just makes the whole concept of social media planning a lot less painful. Oh my God, except this whole like, do you need help thing? No, I don't need help. But apparently I have to touch this to save my stupid thing. So that's Planoli. Um, oh yeah, they have a drafts thing too where you can upload like a bunch of pictures and things and save them for later. If you have an idea, but you're not ready to plan for it, you can you can always start by uploading and then carry on later. So there, social media planning is perfect for people who need social media but don't want to be on it all the time. And for me, it's really important too because I get really sensitive on social media, and I don't want to like I I have to put a lot of separation between myself and my social media platforms, especially if I'm opening myself up to criticism. Yes, I can take criticism pretty well, but when it comes from a crazy racist person, like I just don't want to deal with it all the time, you know what I'm saying? And it will happen. As soon as you start opening yourself up to it, it will happen. Damn it. Go back. Okay. So after you deal with all of your social media stuff, ugh, then you need to connect with your local media providers and get local with it. Um, so again, we do have a marketing director at TFO, but I did the marketing myself for a long time, which is where I learned most of this stuff. Um, so in Branson, because it's a small town, we have like a handful of like maybe one or two TV stations. Otherwise, everything comes from Springfield, which is the larger metropolitan area near Branson, um, which is also where our like NPR station is and stuff. So we actually end up spending a lot of money and like marketing resources up in Springfield. Um, but connecting with the newspapers, like right, newspapers are super relevant for us because so much of our audience is older and they still read the newspaper, so it's important. Um, there are a couple of local magazines that we submit articles and schedules to. We try and get like our concert schedule out to as many local like arts calendars, which there aren't that many. There are maybe like three arts calendars and then um, a couple of magazines and any any local events calendar we try to get on. Um, and TV. Uh, TV is kind of a mixed bag, but last year Chelsea and Aaron and I went to a super like crack of dawn early morning TV thing that would actually end up being really beneficial for our uh, concert series that year. A lot of people came and said that they um, showed up because they saw those segments so early in the morning. Um, oh, hello. Uh-oh. Where did I leave off? The, the TV show early in the morning with Chelsea and Aaron. Right. Early in the morning, TV show with Chelsea and Aaron was super fun, except it was so early. It was so early, but it was really good for TFO because a lot of people who, a lot of people who saw the, at, um, the segments did come to our concert. Um, yeah, or and visit our website. Our website traffic was up and our audience attendance was up. Um, all that stuff is really important, but you kind of have to cater um, your priorities and what is most important based on your own community. And that requires getting to know your own community a lot. Um, and it's not as difficult as it seems. Like, again, you won't know unless you try. Um, there are, you know, a ton of different email templates and, uh, press release templates that you can find just by Googling it. Um, and 
like I said, you never know if you try it, so you send out the stuff to as many relevant places as you can find. And people, if you're, as long as you're offering something great, <laughs> people will listen eventually. Sometimes not. Um, and we also have good relationships with our local arts councils, both in Springfield um, and in Branson. Um, we try to engage our Branson Arts Council to go in on a venue with us at least once. Um, now, like as of two years ago, they own a place called Historic Owen Theater, which is in downtown Branson. Um, we did a, our wind ensemble concert there last year, which was really fun. That was a really nice little venue. Um, and in the past, before that, they did a lot of their concerts at the Old Stone Church, which is another popular TFO venue. It's a little, like, single room building with a piano in it. It's great. We love it. Um, but sometimes local arts councils are also grant makers and can help support your organization or your project um, with fundraising. Um, the Branson Arts Council doesn't give grants, but the Springfield Arts Council does. So every year we typically win a Springfield Arts Council grant. Uh, logos, we saw them. Okay, and here are some of the little advertisements we've made for social media. Thank you, Stephen Smith, for being awesome. So this is our thing about aliens by Jamie Whitmarsh. Um, and we use this little banner to advertise on social media and also in the children's library where we were doing a little preview event. Um, oh, and with the schools, because we did, we did two performances of the whole work, but we did two preview performances at the library for their summer reading program to get kids involved and excited before we started doing the performances. Um, and here's a lovely ad again for our jazz orchestra. When we're doing concerts in person, we always have like little flyers that go out on social media and emails um, just to, uh, what do we do with them? To individualize each concert to show that each concert is a special and different event. This is important in a community like Branson where the, the show scene is the same every night. Um, basically in a Branson show, you design the show at the beginning of the season and you do the same show twice a day, every day, until Christmas. And then it's Christmas. And then you have the off season. And you do it all again. It's great. No, it's terrible, I think. Um, so yeah, we're just trying to set ourselves apart. And here's an example of, um, I think this is our very first cover photo ever. Um, we try really hard to get our orchestra members and our community members involved to help us get the word out because of course one of the greatest marketing resources that I have not talked to you about is word of mouth. And that can be as simple as sharing an image on social media, making it your what is cover photo or your profile photo or whatever. And then we get into fundraising. Oh, we'll come back to that. Super fun. Are there any questions about marketing? No questions. Stop the share. My throat is tired. I just talked a lot. I get super into marketing. So I'm sorry. If I did, if I blew over anything and you want me to like clarify anything or go back, like just let me know. I'm also recording this so you'll have it for future use. Thanks, Kyle Dixon, for reminding me that I should be recording these things. Um but if there are no questions, I will let you all go and rest my feeling my inner singer right now. Um, and if you have questions later, you can always shoot me an email um, or text me or just, just ask. I'm happy to help. I hope you enjoyed this lovely chat about marketing. And I guess I'll talk to you all later. All right. Thank you.